Hi, everybody. Welcome. My name's uh, Ted Kesek, and, and you know, I, I, I teach here. It's my day job, and I try to do a good job of it. And then my night job, every once in a while, is to be the coordinator of this lecture series, which is in many ways more fun. So this is the third lecture, believe it or not, in this uh, four lecture uh, series for the 2012-13 year. And um, I just wanted to say, honestly, it's, it's uh, a perfect day to have a lecture on district energy systems. This is the kind of day that's ideally suited to it. Today was also a very good day if we would have had a lecture on passive solar heating. It's exactly the kind of day you want. Clear sky, lots of sun, and every BTU of energy that comes through the windows, you can actually use it for space heating. You don't have to reject it because it's making the space too hot. So, you know, we could have had one of those, but we don't. We're having district energy instead. And now, for those of you who uh, are interested in getting a certificate, and I, and I think so far everybody's got their certificates from last year, and if I, you didn't get your certificate, it's because you didn't fill out one of those forms. You're supposed to fill out one of those forms that are at the front here and hand them in after the lecture. So I don't want to see like a, a herd of people descending on the forms right now, but you can, you'll have enough time after the lecture. You can pick up a form, fill it out, drop it in the box, and we will process you, and you will get your own very individualized, bespoke, Certificate, be able to claim your credits and all that kind of good stuff. So, so that's the, the, the important thing. As long as you can print clearly, it's been a problem. We were challenged about three, three to four percent of the, of the submissions last time. We ended up having to go to the uh, drugstore at the corner and ask the pharmacist exactly what is this. And they said, oh, well, that's, everybody knows what that is. And I said, oh, of course, you know. So, so just to let you know. <clears throat> and, and we're worried that the pharmacist might retire. We won't have anybody to decipher what these things say. So, so do your best job in your printing. Anyway, at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Paul Sheehy from Tremco Roofing to welcome everyone. Paul. Uh, thank you, Ted. Uh, I'll be very short and sweet. For those of you who are returning, welcome back. For those of you who are here for the first time, welcome. Uh, it's been an honor for Tremco Roofing to be associated with the University of Toronto in this lecture series now, I believe, in year four. Uh, I've, tr I've been to every lecture except for one, I believe, which I was traveling. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's been a great honor on, um, for Tremco. So just to give you a little, little short commercial on Tremco, we've been manufacturing in Leaside since 1930. We have a facility at, uh, in Leaside of three buildings, 420 square feet, 420,000 square feet, I should say, and uh, over 12 acres, and we're a zero landfill facility. Uh, we're the benchmark for sustainability in terms of manufacturing in the GTA in southern Ontario. So other than that, I'll turn it back to Ted. Welcome, and look forward to talking to you after the lecture. For those of you who've never been to one of these, we always have a complimentary uh, beverages and uh, snacks afterwards but uh, with a cast bar for the special refreshments. The special refreshments have alcohol in them, so you have to pay for those, but all the non-alcoholic beverages and snacks are free, so, so you, may wanna, you may wanna stay after and mingle and chat with colleagues. And I, 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 I discovered that for some reason, there's some people, over the four years I've been doing this, I've had people come up to me and say things to me like, the last time I was in this building was 1976. And I thought, wow, you know? You took a job that far away. That's how long the commute is, huh? You know? Um, but anyway, no, there were other reasons, apparently. Um, so, so, um, so for all of you who are returning after a long time, welcome back. Anyway, now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for tonight's lecture, Urban Ziegler. Um, you know, every once in a while, I'm fortunate, I get to meet someone who combines engineering with human values and, and in, in a very compelling way. And, and that's Urban for sure. From the moment I met Urban, he impressed me as someone who really cared about the world, but not in a mushy, emotional way, which of course can be expected from a Swedish engineer, uh, but in a practical manner. And, and he's a person who proves it is possible to have your head in the clouds while your feet are firmly planted on the ground. So, so I think you'll be able to judge that for yourself uh, after you've heard his lecture. So uh, please welcome Urban Ziegler, and uh, I hope you enjoy tonight's lecture.
Thank you, Ted. Yeah. So what I'm going to do today, I'm going to talk about district energy and where can we use it and what it is. So uh, I'm going to go through a couple of different examples so you can see where, where actually district energy will fit in, into a community. So here, here's actually the first district energy system I did in Canada. Uh, this is a community up in, oh, I'm supposed to stay here actually, <laughs> and this, this is um, way up in northern Quebec, in the, the community is called Uchibugamo, and the village was designed by Douglas Cardinal in 91, and it was commissioned and ready about 92, so Douglas Cardinal actually designed these buildings up here, I think this is the band office, the school looks similar, this is a daycare center, and there is housing, so this is a Greenfield District Energy System. Uh, th th this community is rather close to one of the NORAD stations, and uh, they got money from Hydro Quebec to start a new village because this, this creek community had been moved around all the time. And uh, the chief of the, the, the band at the time, he said that he had been to the NORAD station that was very close to this location, and he said, they have district energy, why, why shouldn't we have it? We're gonna stay here. We're not just here for a couple of months or a couple of years. We are here to stay forever. So we want to invest in, in a sustainable development that's going to be here forever. And, and the interesting thing is, uh, th this is actually the energy plan for this, this. I designed that, so that's rather ugly compared to that, I guess. But <laughs> um, this is the biomass plant. Uh, and what, what, what this whole village is, is heated by biomass from an old uh, wood waste pile that was about 40 kilometers away from the village. And when I looked at it and did the first numbers of it, they had about 200 years of heat in that pile if they just kept on digging to feed this, this plant. Of course, the, 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 some of the wood waste de degrade over time, so you can't actually use it for that long. But uh, it's quite an interesting concept. They are 100% biomass up in northern Quebec. This system was, of course, much more expensive to put in than, than what Hydro-Quebec proposed to them, to have electric resistance heaters everywhere. And um, when we did it, uh, no, everyone, of course, said you can't do it. It's too cold up in, in this part of the world. And how deep when you bury the pipes? We said uh, only two feet. That should be enough because the pipes are going to be hot all the time. So they're ne never going to freeze. And we have standby generators in here. So the water will never stop. We will never freeze. <coughs> so this is actually a new building that they just built. In. It's um, a museum they put up. But it's a fabulous, beautiful place to go to. Uh, other examples of district energy system is uh, an existing city. Uh, I'm showing Honolulu here, and they are just very close to start a brand new district cooling system. What they're going to do, they're going to pull up water from about 450 meters below sea level. The pipe is going to be five feet in diameter and three inches shock, uh, thick, and pull it into the city, cool the buildings, and then pull it back out and release it in, in, in the ocean again. So th th this is an existing city doing district cooling. Actually, a similar system exists here in Toronto, of course, but it took 20 years from the first study till it was built. But as soon as it's built, you start to, to, to get subscriber and you see the benefits of it. And I, I believe they're now looking into expanding the system and putting in a second pipe. So green, green, um, Greenfield, existing cities. But the other thing that's happening too is brownfields. This is a picture from, from um, Gothenburg where I went to school in Sweden. And this picture is taken about 1979. Uh, no, 75, I think it says somewhere. Uh, it was shipyards, but of course that industry died and died away. And uh, this was basically industrial wasteland. It was left empty for another 20 years. But they redeveloped it, and now it looks like this. There's offices, there's schools, there's universities there. There's housing uh, all over along the river. So this picture is actually taken from approximately the same point as, as the other one. The big ship would have been sitting right here, as we see on the other ship. So this community is low energy, um, uh, low energy housing, uh, high density but developing an, an industrial uh, wasteland, a brownfield, to a very, very attractive area. And it, this is now uh, actually the most expensive part of Gothenburg to live in. All district heating, 
uh, and they have central garbage collection systems, so all the garbage is sucked into one, one central system too. Uh, so what, what is a district energy system? And th this picture is actually from Gothenburg and trying to describe, describe what, what um, a district energy system consists of. We, of course, have the, the, the traditional electricity system, the yellow line, that's powered by uh, standard power generation, condensing power station, nuclear power stations, hydro, wind, PV and hydro, it feeds into that system. But then also we have the, the, the red line here and that's the district heating system. And that's collecting heat from, from industry. Uh, they have um, the garbage collection go to energy from waste plant. That takes the heat, feeds it back. They produce power too, that feeds out to the other grid. Uh, the, the, the sewage sludge from the community goes to a biogas plant that produces biogas that can be used for, uh, for cars or it goes to the CHP plant to produce uh, heat and power again that feeds back out to the grid and the heat goes back into the system. Uh, all the forest waste from, from nearby um, forest and actually waste from um, the city itself goes back to a biomass plant and they burn that there. Uh, there is PV systems connected. Uh, they have actually, the, in the last few years, they have started to develop a um, uh, district cooling system. So what do they do? They, I actually wrote lake here, but it could have, say, a river too. Uh, what they do, they collect water from the river uh, and go through the cooling system. They have a, a station here that's using the traditional chillers and produce cooling. But also, you see, there's a little connection here, and that is taking heat to produce cooling. So we are using an absorption chiller. So combining all the system into to one system to feed your community. Uh, did I miss any points here? Uh, so that is a district energy system. Of course, you don't build that up overnight, but uh, uh, I looked back. When did they start in Gothenburg to do that? It's, it's about in, 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 in the early 70s they started to develop district energy in the town of Gothenburg. And now over 90% of all buildings in the city is connected to the district energy system. So it took some time, but Everything takes time and you have to, to work on it. Uh, district energy too is, is, um, is a whole combination of things. So this is an, an interesting map. So, so downtown Gothenburg is around here. And you see some of the power plants, uh, the, the heating production plants is, is way out. So I put in the scale so you can kind of see the size of it. But what is happening too is there, there's communities out so they, they connect out. But what is happening too now, when you start to build this system up, uh, this is a different city. Uh, uh, so they're a little bit apart, but what, what they did, they, they put a pipe in between. So if they need energy, they can buy it from Gothenburg Energy. If Mundell has too much, they can sell it back. So they trade it the same way as we trade electricity. So it's become a, a complete system. Uh, And how does a power station look like, a heating station? This, I took this picture because I, I, I think it's a fantastic building. It's a green roof. These three towers here are heat storage tanks, so they store heat. And this is a peaking plant that is actually located at the, the airport in Copenhagen. They've got three, three boilers, three stacks. Uh, I don't know exactly what's into that building, but it can be done quite attractively. And looking from the other side, it's a rather attractive building for be, uh, being a power generation, heat, heat generation for the city of, of, of Copenhagen. So also when you start to do, build this infrastructure, you can now start to connect other things. You can have uh, different technologies. Right now in, in, in Denmark, they, they're drilling very, very deep to get the heat out of the earth just to heat the district heating system. So you invest more and more into multiple technologies within the system. Uh, here is a traditional old ugly uh, power station and this is actually going to be the wood gasification project of Gothenburg. They're going to generate about a thousand gigawatt hours of, of heat but 
because this, the, the system is changing all the time, it's also designed so you can actually uh, manufacture gas that you can drive the cars on. Or, as I showed on the other slide, you can use, use it for power generation. Uh, because what is happening, uh, we are improving the buildings. So we, in, in some cases, we use less energy. So they don't really know the, in the future what's going to happen. So they have a dual usage of this, this plant. And, and it's kind of interesting because driving a car with wood waste, it was what we used to do during the war. And these, these, the, the other plant there is probably just three kilometers away from uh, the Volvo main manufacturing plant where this car was made, plus this wood gasifier that you put on the back of your car. You gasified wood, put it into the engine and drove it. And this was the very latest model before the war ended that they, they, um, they sold. You could actually open the trunk and you just had it on, on the hook in the back of the car so you didn't have to have a trailer. So it's coming back, but now we're doing it in a different scale. This is kind of a, a funny solution to biomass gasification. This, this, there's a TV program in, in, in England called Bang Goes the Theory, and what they're trying to do there is actually showing how technologies is working and what you can do with it. So they manufacture the, uh, uh, a biomass gasification cow, and actually this cow was driven from, I believe, London to Manchester, using coffee grinds from Starbucks. So again, you can take those coffee grinds to put back into the other plant, make heat, you can make gas, or you can make heat and power. So it's all a combination of the things, and that's what you get when you do district energy, uh, large-scale energy systems. Uh, other parts of the system, what you can do is, is um, this is Gothenburg again. And they want to experiment and see, like Ted just mentioned here, solar water heating. These are large solar water heaters put on, on large buildings in, in the outskirts of the city, collects heat that goes back into the district energy system. So you don't need to meet the load of that individual building because then it will be too big. You can now build them as big as you can and just put them into the, 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 the system. So now you have a, a complete system. So, in, again, I'm going back to Gothenburg because it's, it's kind of a, an interesting city. It's Sweden's second largest city, an industrial city. Uh, you've got industry and um, offices. So where is the energy coming from in that city? So only 28% of all the, the energy in that system is coming from fossil fuels. But only 3% of that is coming from boilers directly. The heat is coming, 25% of those, that is fossil fuel, is actually coming from the combined heat and power systems. Uh, heat recovery from power units, traditional condensing power stations, they're connected up to that to, to, to grab the, the energy from that. Waste energy is 30% of the pie. 26% uh, 20, comes from refineries, and 4% from sewage treatment. And then, the last 14% is renewable energy, biomass and, uh, and things like that, uh, solar water heating. So quite an interesting mixture of how a city can actually change by, by mixing these things. And back in the 90s, I was <laughs> traveling around in Sweden looking at district energy plants. We went into one in the middle of Sweden. Uh, and this, this large plant had you had oil-fired, natural gas, coal-fired plant, and a biomass plant. And that day, in the middle of the winter, uh, we asked them what they were burning. And they were burning demolition waste from, from Germany. That was the cheapest fuel at the time. They had bought some barges of demolition wood waste from Germany that was floated all the way up to Sweden, and they burned that because that was the cheapest fuel and high, most efficient way of, of generating electricity for that community that day. So you, you can introduce many interesting things when you build up big systems. So he, here is the plumbing. What's going on? And I've actually brought with me some pieces. So I'm going to come to them later, but I think we can start to shift them around. These are the pipes. Uh, the, the, the water comes into the building. Then you have an energy transfer station. The heat goes to the, the space heating and you have another heat exchanger that goes to the domestic hot water. 
So that, that's in basic is how it looks like. Here's samples of the pipes. Here is, is, is a pipe where it's two pipes within one, so it's quicker to put out or install. This is plastic, similar pipe, but it's steel. The difference between these two is that you can use different temperatures. Here you can just go to about 90, 95 degrees C. When you use steel pipes, you can do up to 120 degrees C in the pipes. So you can have higher capacity for smaller pipes. So, so send these around and you can have a look at them. This is a brace plate heat exchanger that will sit in here. And, and this is actually before it's, it's, it's soldered together. So you can see the different pieces. And there's one cut through. But this is basically a little bit on the small side, but it could replace your d domestic hot water tank, domestic hot water heating system in your home. This is all you need. So take that and send it around to you. So you get a feel for what it is. But th there you can actually see the, 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 the size of this equipment. Uh, what is happening more and more now too is, is we, we are changing how the design of the, the system is. Uh, when, when you had a building that was built 30, 40, 50 years ago, the temperature in, in the radiator was probably about 80 or close to 90 degrees C. So it was very hot and the return was was about 70. Now, uh, in Gothenburg, they are aiming at, when it's zero degrees outside, the, the supply temperature is 45 degrees C. So they can heat the building at 45 degrees C. And of course, the more you can, and, and for the rates too, when you do this, the rate, the, the lower you can lower the temperature com coming back to the system, the cheaper the, your energy cost will be. So they have an incentive to, to bring it down the temperature differential between the supply and return. The more you can do, the more capacity you will have in your system. So, so now they're really, really trying, trying to push it down. And the reason for that, if you can do that, you can grab cheaper energy from the, uh, from the district energy production plant. Uh, so here, here is actually the, the pipes. They come in long lengths. Uh, every pipe typically have a, a sensor in it. So you can do, um, if the pipe have any problems, it is for leak detection. They are very well, well insulated. Uh, and in a typical system, you probably see heat loss is no more than 2 to 3% over a year if you don't have any major leaks in them. So they are very efficient, these pipes. Uh, and they can be very, very large. These, these are probably about 100 millimeters across, but they can be big, big, big. And, and how do you install them? Typically in very shallow, shallow trenches, you can see them, the road surface here, and the typical depth of the trench is about two feet, 600 millimeter to the bottom of the trench. Of course, you have to be very careful when you do, do these sections here. So you can see that the, the, this is a double pipe, the welding. And as you, you can also see on the samples that the, the, the diameter of the pipe, uh, the thickness of the pipe is very thin. It's what we call a thin wall pipe. It's a schedule 20, where you typically do all other heating pipes in schedule 40. But the reason for that is if you're the thinner the pipe you have, the less expansion you will have in it and the less problems you will have when you install these pipes. What you also do typically when you build these systems, before you backfill the trenches, you heat up the water in the pipes so the pipes are actually warm before you do the backfilling. So you can actually reduce the, the, the stresses of the pipes in the system before, before you backfill. And you also have to put in uh, compensators that can take the, the, the stresses in the pipe depending on, on the expansion. So, um, uh, uh, 
uh, energy transfer stations. Here is slightly different from the, the energy transfer station I just uh, sent around. This is actually a, a plate heat exchanger. You can, you've probably seen that in the industry. Uh, this, this you can this bolt it together so you can actually open it, take it apart and, and clean it. And this, this heat exchanger here is from a rather large building. It could be a school, an office building or something like that. You can see the, the ventilation duct here kind of give, gives it away the size of the, the building. So the district energy comes from the street in here, goes in, oops, is happening there? goes in here, goes into the heat exchanger, and crosses one, comes out here, then it goes into the next heat exchanger, and crosses that, and goes back out. And using two heat exchangers to optimize the, the temperature drop over the system. Here's the pump that is dealing with the circulation on, on, on the building side, and you have a control system within it. So this, 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 this replaces probably a couple of large boilers in, 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 a, in a school or an office building. And you can see uh, there is no scale, but you can kind of get an idea of the, the size of it. And when you come to smaller buildings, it can become like a, a small cabinet that sits on the wall. Uh, this here, it looks like this heat exchanger here is actually insulated, but it's the same as the one I'm sending around. So the pipe connecting to the district energy system, there will be two connections, supply and return. There will be an energy meter in here. There will be a circulation pump for, for the house side of um, the building. The energy meter will check the dif difference between the temperature supply and return and the flow, so you can actually pay for the amount of energy you take out. That energy meter will also meet, uh, meet the, the maximum demand, demand you're taking out because the more you use, the same as for electricity, the peaking load, the more you have to pay. And the lower the supply temperature, return temperature you give, the cheaper it will be. <laughs> Here's another system, and I think this is actually the expansion vessel for this, 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 um, this heating system. And sometimes, depending on the design, you actually put a storage tank within the um, within the cabinet and these, these comes pre-manufactured and it's easy to connect. Uh, you have to make them in a certain size so actually the plumber can get in there and actually adjust it. So that's, one, one would think with, with the, the heat exchanger that you see there that you can make it smaller but the limitations to all of these is actually being able to exchange the equipment. Uh, other things that happens when you do these uh, uh, district energy system, you can start to invest in other technologies. And uh, here is something that is coming quite fast in, in, in Sweden and in Europe, is prognosis-based control systems. Because you want to maximize the amount of energy you can bring out of these systems. And what you do instead of, what we typically do now, is we're checking the outdoor temperature and then, then we drive our heating system from that. But th these control systems actually checks what the, what the temperature will be in a few hours. So we know what, uh, uh, what will come to the building. So it will, if we know it's going to be very cold, we might overheat it a little bit early and ride a wave. And then on the other hand, when it is cold, when you go to this point and you know it's going to be warmer uh, during next day and you get sun, then you reduce the temperature and then put in the gain in the building. So, so this is something that is, is used more and more in these, these energy systems because we, we start to, the investment is in the infrastructure and you would make, want to make it as good as possible and, and get as much out of it as, as ever, ever possible. And doing these things, uh, the energy reduction from, from a prognosis-based uh, control system, about 10 to 15 percent, quite substantial. Other things that happens, we want to get rid of um, the, the peak electricity loads. So they have started to connect uh, dishwashers, washing machines, and dryers directly to the, um, the district energy system. So again, that changes the whole profile of how, how, how the energy is used in the community. If you can get low, low value energy uh, and you can run the dryer directly on that, there's savings to be made. So 
there's not very many of these out there yet, but it's coming. It's, uh, they, they are promoting more and more of things like that. Um, when you have a large system like this too, uh, these, these bigger communities, they, they, Gothenburg Energy here, they, they um, invested to develop a, a, a control system, a reporting system back to their customers to make sure that they don't use too much energy. So this is actually only showing the, the typical bar, bar graphs. But they, they're using uh, predictive, predictive um, measurements to, to see what actually is happening to the building and controlling that against the weather that was the last months or last period. And then they can report back back to the user if you're doing more than expected for, for, for the system. And again, that's 10 to 15% energy savings into the, the system. So when you're a customer of a large group like that, you can have that directly because they, they connect all the information from the meters back into the system. Uh, so th this is, to me, quite important that, that is missed so many times. We just pay for the energy without actually knowing did we actually use the right amount or not. Uh, so district energy, why do we do it? And I thought I'm going to do a slide that has a little bit of the numbers for it. If you, I use $25 per megawatt hour. Uh, I think gas is now around 26, 27 cents per cubic meter in Ontario, which is roughly that in a large scale. So if you take that and use it in a boiler to produce heat, you have 80% efficiency in, in a larger system. Of course, in your homes, you probably have a condensing boiler, but if for a larger boiler for an industry or a school, it's not a condensing boiler. So say that you get an 80% efficiency. The cost of your, or the value of your energy then is about $31. Because we have to, we, we lose 20% of the stack, so we only get 80% uh, out of the system. When you produce power, again, we take the same natural gas, the efficiency of power generation is, it varies, of course, depending on technology. If you're using a, a reciprocating engine, you're probably in the 40% range. If you use a large combined cycle gas turbine, you can probably push this up to 65%. But using in a little bit of smaller scale, and you know Markham uh, up here, they, they are using reciprocating engines to produce heat and power. They, I, I would guess they are getting in, 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 in the region of 40% efficiency. Then, what it does mean is the electricity you produce is about $62 per megawatt hour. And you get about 40% in this case of um, electricity. So most of these larger district energy systems, they, they use what we call combined heat and power. So again, it's the same engine, 25 megawatt hours of, of cost for the fuel, 40%, 62%. $62 for the, the electricity. This is not quite correct. You, you typically lose a little bit of efficiency when you do um, combined heat and power, but for argument's sake. But then the 60% of the energy that is left, if you put heat exchangers on that, you put a heat exchanger on, on the oil cooler, you put a heat, heat exchanger on the water cooler, and you put a heat exchanger on, on the exhaust from, from, from the engine and collect 80% of that, that is free energy. And that represents about half a megawatt hour. So what is that worth? That is worth 15. You don't pay anything from that. And you can sell that for $31 a megawatt hour for the typical user. And this become, becomes the driver for, for many energy systems. So in Canada, I think, I believe there is about 85 district energy systems. Uh, some, some of them using biomass, and of course the biomass is typically cheaper, so that's why these, these systems uh, can be done. Do, doing a, a system just from the gas and selling it from the gas probably is going to be very, very complicated, and you probably can't get the economics together. But if you can combine that with, with uh, um, combined heat and power, you can probably make it work. 
Uh, one, one project I did back in the 90s was um, the city of Cornwall. And Cornwall is a kind of an interesting example. It's the only, or used to be the only uh, utility, the only city in Ontario that didn't get the um, electricity from Ontario Hydro. They bought it from the US. And um, the, the, the manager of, of Cornwall Electric at the time, he said, we are up for new negotiations with, with, um, with the Americans to, to buy our power. and we, we want to cut down the peak. What can we do? Should we put in district energy? So um, I was called as a consultant to, to look into the system and we, we came up with, um, we put some of these machines in, we can heat, uh, there was two hospitals and five or six schools, that would be enough. And when they proposed that, actually even before, before they were built, they had something in the hand, they didn't need to buy the peaking power anymore because they could do the peaking themselves. The, the, the lower cost of the electricity they had to buy from the US actually paid for the whole plant. So it was kind of an interesting concept when they bought in the, the, the cogeneration to, to pay for the whole thing. It was paid for by just to reduce electricity costs. So that is why we do it. We, we get that free, free heat that we can sell. Uh, so now I want to take a, a look at how does the economics look for a building of, of, of district energy. And this is actually a picture of my brother's home in Gothenburg. Uh, if you remember that first picture when we take taken down, down the wharf or the shipyards, that is basically what that picture was taken from. He lives in this house right now. This is his front door. And there's a door just beside it. That is the energy transfer station. It's rather messy, I told him it was messy, and yes, he said, <laughs> they got a lot of shit, this developer who built this whole uh, uh, set of houses, they have apparently got a lot of slack for, for doing it this way instead of buying a, a pre-assembled district energy system. But he, he is for the, uh, the underfloor heating he has in the, base, the, in, in the first floor here, and the, the washrooms connected here. This is the heat exchanger up here, for, for his whole home, and right here sits the heat exchanger for the domestic hot water. This is all what he's got. It sits on the outside, so the utility actually has the key to this, this door, so if there's a problem, they can run and fix it. He doesn't need to be home. Uh, so it, it's, it's not nice looking, but this is about um, 600 by 600 millimeters, two, two by two feet. So it doesn't take very much space. So what I did yesterday is I thought, well, what, how can we actually see the difference between heating, a heating system in, in, um, in Sweden to here? And we all know that the, the cost of energy in Europe is much, much higher. And when I looked at, actually it's not his home because he's using much less, but I took, took, took a home using about 100 kilowatt hours per square meter, which is, for Canada, probably on the low end. Uh, he is using 65 kilowatt hours for, for space heating and domestic hot water in total for that house. It's built about five years ago. 65 was his average. So it's a little bit more than, than what he is using. But I just want to take it to kind of Canadian scales. So I said 100, 100 kilowatt hours per square meter is probably a pretty good home in Canada. 250, I probably that's the average for a typical subdivision. So that gives you about 25 megawatt hours for, for heating. And I took here, this is what, I'm, what I paid last year for the gas in average, $28 per megawatt hour, or roughly 28, 30 cents per cubic meter of gas prior to tax. Uh, I have a high efficiency furnace, and which is probably in most um, uh, subdivisions, that's the most, probably the most common. That gives me my energy cost about 30. He is paying about 88, so about three times what I pay for the, for the gas. So his energy cost is kind of rather high, so that's electricity in, in Sweden is probably around 25 cents a kilowatt hour too and we pay 11, 12, 13. So 
then one will think that his cost will be much, much higher than mine. But the one thing that we have to take into account, I have to own and operate my, my furnace and my water heater and maintain it. And a few years ago, I had to replace mine. I live in a house that was built in the 60s. So we had to put in new equipment, and the old equipment wasn't more than 10 years old, and it was about $8,000. So if I say I take that cost, spread it over 10 years, and say that I borrow all the money, that will cost me about $1,000 a year. To that, I need to rent my, I rent my water heater, pay about $350 a year for that, and I put in about $100 of maintenance in average over those 10 years, which is probably fairly reasonable because most likely a fan or something will break down or a control system, that's, and then you end up paying five, six hundred thousand dollars So of course you don't pay 100 per year. So that one plus that one plus my energy cost gives me a cost of about $2,200 a year. My brother, he pays a lot for the energy. He pays $15 a month for full service for this unit. The, the, the um, utility owns it, but he has to pay a service fee to, to maintain it. $15 a month, so $180 a year. His energy cost is, of course, very high, but look at the numbers in the end. So only maybe a couple of hundred dollars more he's paying than what I'm paying. And what we should remember now, the gas here is rather cheap. It used to be way, way more. So the gas cost has gone down recently. So district energy doesn't necessarily need to be very expensive. The, the, the problem with district energy is actually understanding the cost you have to pay for the energy in your, your, your building or your home or what, whatever you're trying to heat. And these numbers here is all excluding taxes. Of course, taxes in Sweden, you know that, they are very high, so I think they pay probably 25%, and we, what do we pay, 13%. So that, that will, of course, give another change. But as I said, my brother, I asked him, he's using 65 kilowatt hours per square meter, compared to I'm probably using 150, 180 in my home. So, where, where is the future going to take me with all of this? Uh, I, in, in Sweden, there was a big um, uh, building boom in the 70s to, to build an awful lot of apartment buildings. What they're doing right now, they are converting them and insulating them and make them energy efficient. So, this is reducing, of course, the loads on the system. What is also happening, they're building newer uh, residential and they have very, very low energy usage. Uh, they are talking now for an apartment building less than four, 45 kilowatt hours per square meter. So the, the guys at the district energy system, they are saying that in some of these buildings, it's barely worthwhile connecting a heating system to the plant. Uh, but then, of course, the problem will be, should you use electricity for peaking uh, when it's really, really cold, then every, the peak will grow much, much higher. So there's a lot of work now going into to see what, how should you actually heat these buildings for the future. Uh, and, and I don't think they have found the right solution yet. So that is for heating. But of course, for cooling, you will need a cooling system, especially in a climate like ours. Uh, what is the energy, energy cost going to do? Uh, probably, if you look at uh, gas and um, gasoline and uh, home heating fuel, it's kind of I've climbed over the last couple of last 10, 12 years. But again, it goes up and down. We don't know where it's going to go. If you look at natural gas, this is Canada. We, we were up to about $12 per million BTU back in... Uh, or was this 2006? Where are we now? Two or three. So of course this will have a big impact in, in, in what we're gonna do in energy system. How should it look like and how, how do we build it? Probably the most important for, for, for ma many of these systems, you, you build a system that is a combination with storage where you, you can produce the heat in low rates 
and have um, possibly individual storage in, in these buildings. District cooling is probably always going to be a good option for North America. Um, so the future is energy, district energy the solution, who knows? This is something that we have to see, we have to plan, but you have to take the long-term view on it. You can't just say that and district energy is good or bad, or you have to, you have to crunch the numbers. And, and it, it, sometimes it will be good, sometimes it will be bad. I'm a little bit quicker than I thought, so. And you haven't asked any questions. Are there any questions? <laughs> Zone heating, every room is controlled. Every room is controlled. Yeah, so it's typically uh, in Europe, it, it's, it's the, the, the space heating is a radiator on each room, and each room has a, a thermostat in it, so you control it in each and every room. But you know, even today, even though the temperature is minus 13 or whatever, when the sun's coming through, the air is probably on, and the other side, you need the heating, so how do you handle that? Um, in, 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 if you have a, 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 a hydronic system, there will be no heat coming in the sun side and all the heat will come in the other side because you have a, a control system in each room. And I, I had a discussion with someone um, a, a few weeks ago and saying, we're buying a home for, for several hundred thousand dollars. It's got one thermostat in it. You buy a car for, for $30,000 and it's got two, maybe four, thermostat, you can control it the front, the driver and the passengers and even in the back. I think it can be controlled. You need to install more, more dampers and valves if you've got an air system, if you've got a, a radiant system. There is, in each room, there is a thermostat that turns it on and off. Yeah. Uh Or, you, you know, so district heating, rather than a simple comparison, I would suggest of cost, immediate cost benefit analysis, has much more to do with its integration of overall infrastructures and as a way of planning future cities or reimagining servicing existing cities such as Toronto. No, you, 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 you're absolutely correct. There, there is enough waste heat in, in the oil sands to heat every single building. I actually did a project back in 92, um, the Lakeview Generating Station, converting one of the turbines that I was, I, I believe it was four or six, uh, converting one of the turbines to cogeneration mode. We would lower the efficiency of that by, by a few percent. And we started to put piping from Lakeview Generating Station up Highway 10, collecting to, to up to the square one um, shopping center on even north, all the existing buildings at the time could be serviced from that one turbine. So the waste heat is there and you can do it. The thing is, the problem is, you have to invest in the infrastructure. Someone has to take the, the, the bull by the horn and we have to build this system and it's gonna be a long-term system. Look at Toronto, they, 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 they talked about district cooling for 20 years before they put a pipe in. And within a few years, the, the, the system is oversubscribed because they see, they realize it is actually cheaper and better to have it. Now they wanna build a second system within just a few years of putting in the first. So the old district energy systems, like in Toronto, was a steam system. 
that steam system, you produce steam, pull it over to the building, and the condensate was actually down in the drain and straight out. So the efficiency was very low. And the other thing with the steam system is that you have to keep the same temperature of, of the supply at all times. But now, with this new um, district energy system, you vary the supply temperature depending on the load. So they are designed probably for typically from for, for 60, maybe even down to 50 or, or less than that. And at the very peak, they can go up to 130 degrees in the, the steel pipes. So the delta T is the amount of energy you can pull out. And when in the summer, you pull it back as much as you can to reduce the losses and being efficient. So district energy systems, you have to take the long-term view and you have to do it and install it. And it, it's a community system. It might be cheaper in, in, in the short run to look at just putting in an individual boiler and no one has to put in the pipes in the ground. Uh, someone put actually the pipe in the ground and that was a gas company. They could do that because they, the, the, the gas company is uh, rate based. So they are guaranteed a return on, on the investment of the pipe in the ground. I think district energy in Canada will, if, if, if the, the energy company can have a rate-based structure too to, to recover the investment in the pipe, district energy will take, take hold. It's, it's the whole uh, philosophy, what is it, what, why can't we do it, why can't we do it? I started with Roger Bogan, where I think there lives about, right now, about 700 people. When I was there in 92, I think it was about 100, 150 people. So, uh, no, that is really, you, you can start small, and what probably will happen if you small start with a small system, a smallish area, uh, a subdivision, you will probably fairly soon say that it wants to grow. People want to connect to it. They want to have that little service room on the outside. You don't want to have all the space that it takes in, in, in your building. Um, what about the cost in terms of having the, the biomass generators that kind of stuff? Right? Yeah, you have to take the long-term view. It's not, and, and this, this is the thing that, that we have to learn, is actually how to calculate the return on an investment. So uh, many times when, when people are looking at investments, we're only, only, only looking at, at uh, the simple payback, and if the simple payback is over five years, uh, for, for, for an investment, no one wants to do it. You, you have to be able to borrow money. That, that is, is the basic of the whole thing. You have to be able to borrow money. Actually, in Canada, there is, um, there's a lot, the, the federation from the municipalities, they have grants, and they have cheap money that you can borrow for building district energy systems. Um, yeah, in North America, there seems to be, over, in the, over here. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> uh, in North America, there seems to be a lot of these, the large, old steam systems. Um, could you comment on the, is there any uh, potentially uh, cheap way to convert them to hot water? Or what do you do with those old large steam systems like in New York or Toronto uh, moving forward? How do you convert them to hot water or can you in a cheap way? Um, I don't think there is really a cheap way, but people do it. Uh, I think uh, the University of British Columbia uh, and Stanford, they recently converted both of their district energy system to the hot water. And I think it's, what, what's going to happen now is we, we have invested a lot of money into uh, reducing the energy consumption. Uh, so um, so they, 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 they invest in, I don't know what this building has, is, is they doesn't work. <laughs> but some, some of the systems are old, and when you have an old steam system, yes, it's going to be costly to, 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 to modify it. But if you take the long-term term, um, view on it. Uh, we did it in, in Cornwall. The, the hospitals there were steam heated. We converted them to, 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 um, uh, to hot water. It can be done. 
the, the piping, you cannot use the piping again. You have to put in new piping because some, some of those district energy systems, it, it's, uh, they are not even insulated, the pipes. And there is not return pipes either. So wh one of the things that held back Toronto for many years was the, the, the franchise that Toronto District Heating at the time had for supplying heat in the ground. No one else were allowed to build a system. So uh, you have to apply for a franchise to, to put pipes in the ground. And Toronto District Heating had that. So no one else in Toronto were allowed to build district energy systems. Now I think um, that has changed slightly. And in Regent's Park, they put in district heating, the new development there. Markham is putting in district energy, and people are looking all over to, to, to build modern systems. Uh, sorry, one quick question. Um, could you comment, or do you have any opinions on the somewhat awkward integration of district energy into the LEED uh, certification process? I don't know anything about the lead points and how that work. Unfortunately, I haven't worked with that. So I don't know if, if, if there's any points. For, does anyone know? There's no points for it? Hard to get points. Uh, to get points. There is points uh, for it. The US GBC is looking at completely revised uh, lead standards and they're trying to develop them actually uh, for subdivisions and uh, precincts so that those standards have yet to be developed. Uh, another couple of years. <laughs> There was someone over here? Yeah. Yeah, you wait till you get the, the microphone. Yeah, uh, talking about the uh, low temperature distribution system that uh, you mentioned the possibility of that in the heating uh, dominated places. Uh, just wondering that how the end use could benefit from this low temperature uh, distribution. Are they going to use heat pump or how you suggest? Uh, for the end use part of it. No, no, the, the, the end, end, by meaning of the end use is you, you're talking about the building itself. Yes. The, the, the radiators are sized si so, and the heating system in the building is sized si si such that they use the low temperature. And, and the, the law, you can, as I said, in, 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 in the, the, the systems in Europe, the law you can supply the temperature back to, to, to the grid, the, the cheaper you, you get your energy. So, so uh, one, one way of, of um, using very low, um, low temperature is having uh, underfloor heating uh, because you don't want to have that too warm and uh, hence you have um, um, a low temperature heating system in your building. Someone else? There's one up there. There is some light straight in my face here somewhere. I can't see nothing. Um, I'd like to ask, are there any examples in Canada or more specifically in Ontario where you've had private developers in the real estate sector develop DE systems? The honest answer, I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, the, 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 I, no, I don't really know. Sorry. I have no information. Does anyone know? No? Not just heating, but there are a couple of developers who have been incorporating uh, geothermal heating and cooling in large scale residential developments. In fact, though they sell them off as condominiums, the developers are retaining uh, the geothermal generation as a long term revenue generating model. So they, uh, they invest. There's a I, I think the biggest problem with all of this is getting the, the owners to understand that the cost of energy will not be the same. And that, that is the hardest selling point for, for, for district energy. And if, if you can do it and you can explain it and, and actually checking the cost, there is major savings to be made. Thank you. Um, despite the fact that natural gas is very cheap right now, there are Canadian communities that are looking at alternative fuels such as urban-based wood waste. One of the things, my understanding is that um, municipalities are worried about, however, is community acceptance of these kinds of systems. So wood waste or energy from waste. So I wonder if you might comment on 
how these kinds of challenges were overcome in Sweden or Denmark? I think it's always a long-term process. If anyone says that you're going to have a biomass district energy system in your community, the first thing is you're going to, people are going to say is, well, I don't want to have it to smell like, like my neighbor's um, wood-fired stove is going all the time. So the, what you have to do, you have to really go and see one of these communities and energy systems, biomass energy systems, because they do not smell. They do not, you, you can incorporate them, you can make them small uh, and efficient, and you will not notice them more than, than any, any stack anywhere. That, of course, a cold day like that, you will have a steam plume. But that's all you see. I, I've been to plants in, 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 the, in the middle of a subdivision, a, a large biomass district energy system sitting straight in the middle of, of, of the, the system. And you cannot tell. It's, it's just that we, we are not used to them here. And, and, and you see the one that I showed on, on Ujibugamo there. It's, it's, just an, it's on the outskirts of the community. But you can stand just beside it and you wouldn't know what it is. So it's education. People need to know that it is no smell. There is no energy from waste plants. Of course, it has a bad reputation. So I think that's going to be harder to, to get into a community. But again, I've, I've been to large, large energy from waste plants. You wouldn't know if they're built with modern standards. There was someone over there too. Yeah. Okay. Wait for the microphone. Do you, do you feel that there is a, a lack of political will to uh, explore these systems? And, and if so, what, what do you think are the factors that prohibit um, our representatives from, from pushing these ideas? Um, I, I think it's, it's, if you're a private developer and if you want to start one of these systems, it, it's a long-term investment. And you have to have a large, you have to have a strategy. And, and when I worked on these systems and we tried to build them, there was always someone to, to find a reason why you wouldn't make money. So the, 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 there's a system in, in, in um, the Lakeview generating system that we want to convert. It ended up be, being uh, um, uh, Mississauga Hydro saying they didn't want to have that power system there because they wanted to build their own uh, power plant in, in the region. So they didn't want to have anyone else coming into it. So Because this, this was a private consortium. It was Trans-Canada Pipelines and British Gas and I think Ontario Hydro was part of it too in some shape or form. So it was a private consortium was willing to invest to build a district energy system 20 years ago in Mississauga. But it was shut down by the community. Community owned electricity company. I would guess today they know more. They probably would investigate themselves to put something in. But it is, it's coming back to wh why are we so behind in North America with all, all energy knowledge? And, and, and uh, Ted and I, we discussed earlier uh, what, what, what was done in these buildings in, in Europe 20, 30 years ago. Basically because the, the educational level of understanding energy efficiency and the whole energy concept. It's, in North America, it's handed out to you and me. We have to sort our energy thinking ourselves. And I think that's probably the biggest hurdle. Someone needs to understand it. You have to learn what it is. It's not going to bite you. It's going to cost you more per, per, per megawatt hour. And, and yes, those numbers, they're 88 to 30, three times as much my, my brother is paying for the energy. But he's using less. So actually, he, he, his numbers would have come out less than mine because his house is more energy efficient because he pays more. So the investment in, in making it more efficient is a higher return. I cannot see. There's one question down here. Um, so if you were a homeowner and you installed a solar thermal system in your house, would you want to keep that separate from the, the grid heating in order to maximize your temperature difference and save money, or would they be combined into the same system? Um, 
if, if you have a destructive energy system, you probably want to put it back into the grid. All the heat you collect, you wouldn't put it back into the heat, to, to the grid. And the reason for that is if, if you think about it, when the sun is shining, even today, in my office in Waterloo, I didn't have my heating on. And my wife is very upset about that because the thermostat sits in my office. I work from home. The, the thermostat is in my office and I got two by two meters of windows into it and the sun is just blaring straight in. The heating is not on, but the other end of the house is very cold. So the same would be for your, your solar water heating system. You would not need it, but if you put it all that heat back to the grid, there is someone who is using domestic hot water because you always have the base load and the bigger the system is, then that's why you can do those combined systems. Well, it's just that you were saying that the lower you can put it back into the system, the more money you'd save, the less you cost. Yeah, but, but so. w you have to think about it. When, when you do a district energy system, you, you, are, you have a community system. And the, build, the, the picture there from, from Gothenburg, those large solar heaters, I, I would dare to guess that none, the, the energy they collect from that is way too much for those buildings. That's why it goes to the district energy system, and that's why you combine different sources. Thank you so much. You're most welcome.